Schoenberg Faculty of Nursing, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Lairdal Alumni Lunch and Learn session, Reducing Moral Distress of Nurses During the COVID-19 Pandemic, with our very own Dr. Elizabeth Peter and her research team. I want to highlight that Dr. Peter was awarded funding from U of T's COVID-19 Action Fund for the research she's going to talk about today. I'd like to thank Lairdal Medical Canada for sponsoring this event. Their investment in the continuous professional development for the nursing community is very much appreciated. Before I introduce our speakers today, I'm just going to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Firstly, since we've got such a large crowd today for this event, we are going to keep your microphones muted, but we welcome you to uh, enter your questions in the chat box. And Dr. McIver will facilitate a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Secondly, I want to let you know that we are recording this session so that we can share it with those who are not able to join us today. We will send you an email at the end of the session that will include the link to the recording, as well as a survey so that you can give us some feedback on today's event. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers to you. Dr. Elizabeth Peter is a professor at the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing, a member of the Joint Center for Bioethics, and the chair of Public Health Ontario's Ethics Review Board. Her interdisciplinary academic background in nursing, philosophy, and bioethics has framed her work over the past 30 years. Also joining us is Dr. Tegan Kalaki, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Hospital for Sick Children in the Department of Child Health Evaluative Sciences and a registered nurse at the Peter Monk Cardiac Center at Toronto General Hospital. She completed her PhD at the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing with specialty training in bioethics and critical qualitative health research methodology. Dr. Jane McIver was the Ted Rogers Nursing Professor at the Cardiovascular Research, uh, in Cardiovascular Research and an affiliate scientist at the Toronto General Hospital Research Institute. She completed her PhD at the Institute of Medical Science at the University of Toronto with specialty training in bioethics, cardiovascular sciences, and regenerative medicine. Dr. Sean Mohammed is an assistant professor teaching stream at Bloomberg Nursing. He completed his postdoctoral research fellowship at the Global Institute of Psychosocial, Palliative, and End-of-Life Care at the University Health Network. His scholarly expertise includes post-structural theory, the ethics of death and dying, palliative care, and the medicalization of dying. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Peter, Dr. Kalaki, Dr. McIver, and Dr. Mohammed. And now over to you. I believe Tegan will be sharing uh, the screen. Wonderful. Okay. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Um, as was mentioned, the title of our work is Reducing the Moral Distress of Nurses During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, we've met some of uh, the presenters and authors. Um, there's, you know, Sean Mohammed, Tegan Kalaki, and Jane McIver. But along with that's also Carolyn Variath and Connor Chason, who have been working on other aspects of this project, which I will get into in a moment. Um, a special thank you to the Toronto COVID-19 Action Initiative that's made this research possible. And also a real heartfelt thank you to all of our participants. And I think some of you may even be on uh, watching this right now. So thank you again, without you, we couldn't have done this. So a little bit of background. When this call, uh, research call came out in the spring, we were already hearing media reports that nurses were experiencing moral distress. And we also recognized that research uh, from other pandemics with other coronaviruses, um, particularly SARS and MERS, uh, were identifying nurses' moral distress. And as we moved along in this research, there were also some very recent studies that came out uh, speaking to nurses' experiences of both moral distress and distress during COVID-19. So moral distress um, is, is a term that I think probably most of you are familiar with. 
Uh, from a research point of view, it's a very tricky and contested term. Um, we're not going to get into all of the specifics of it, but normally it's thought to be those reactions and responses, uh, the full range of psycho-emotional and physiological responses that someone feels um, when they cannot behave and act in a way that's consistent with their values, principles, and commitments. So the classic definition, if you will, of moral distress speaks to constraints that people experiences um, and the um, type of reaction that they have when they believe their moral norms have been violated. Um, moral distress is important, however, because it lets us know that some unrelieved human suffering um, is there and that we have both the potential power and limitations in our actions. Uh, previous research has shown that nurses feel a high degree of moral distress, um, often when they believe that there's aggressive treatment um, that they deem to be unnecessary. Uh, nurses also experience this kind of distress when they're in a hierarchy, which is very typical in clinical settings when they don't have the voice they need um, to act on their values and beliefs. And the other thing that comes up um, in um, more in low income countries, but to some extent in high income countries too, is the distress that occurs when there is a shortage of resources. So there are two purposes to our study. The primary part is a, uh, uh, about about collecting primary data collection. And this is our research that we'll be focusing on today about exploring what strategies reduce moral distress. And within this, we've also include, included distress in general so that we wouldn't get caught in these definitional issues again during COVID-19. As we started to move through this research, we recognized that to have a, a rigorous um, literature review would be very helpful. So we've also um, have been conducting a scoping review uh, where we're looking at the experience of moral distress, uh, broadly defined of nurses during current and previous coronavirus outbreaks. So we've been looking at literature from SARS, MERS and COVID-19 and those research findings have been very useful and they'll be included in some of our recommendations to add further evidence to them. So our methodologies and methods, um, we've chosen qualitative description. Again, our goal is very much action oriented. We very much wanted our work to be practical. So what we'll be presenting will be in the everyday language of participants. We're gonna be very much focusing on real world problems and, and practical applications. So we chose this um, approach deliberately um, to enhance those possibilities. Uh, we recruited through the Bloomberg Faculty Graduate Student Listserv and also through Twitter, snowball sampling and word of mouth. Um, again, um, well, the other thing I should mention, we really tried to sample the best we could in terms of finding a very heterogeneous sample. And when I tell you what the sample is, that will make sense. Uh, so some of the methods that we used for this were semi-structured interviews, and we did these over teams, uh, that, and that worked uh, quite well. And I think it also helped people participate who were not in the city of Toronto. Um, we use reflexivity throughout uh, to understand who we, who we are um, and who we've been in this research and to understand how that has an impact on our interpretation um, of our findings and some of the implications. And we've been engaging in thematic analysis. Again, very, this is a very straightforward kind of research approach. Um, we were looking for patterns and concepts and meanings in the data. So our participants, um, so far we've had 24 uh, registered nurses um, participate. Uh, all of them had provided some kind of direct clinical care to someone with COVID-19 or with the suspicion of COVID-19. We've had within that mix, um, some RNs who had leadership in education types of positions, but they were all those nurses who had some direct involvement with care. So those are our participants. Um, we 
have included a div diverse range of practice areas, critical care, transplant, COVID assessment centers, uh, a number of community care people and public health and so on, along with pediatrics, labor and delivery and mental health. We've had a couple of our participants with long-term care um, experience. That's the one area where we were, have been hoping to recruit more participants, um, but there aren't that many RNs in, in long-term care and we haven't had tremendous success in that regard. So, um, because we're very interested in their experience given, given how hard long-term care has been hit. Um, our participants are mainly from Toronto um, and Ontario, um, but we have fortunately had some people out of province as well participate. So these are our preliminary findings. Um, again, I really emphasize preliminary um, and Tegan Kalaki will start the presentation of these findings. Awesome. Thanks, Elizabeth. So I'll just be going through some of the initial and kind of preliminary themes that we found um, as we've started analyzing the interview data that we've collected. So one of the first major themes was uh, the fear of, in of infecting both the self and others. So nurses were not only concerned with catching COVID themselves, but were just as concerned, if not more concerned with actually passing the virus on to others. So um, as we know, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, there were limitations to equipment and PPE, such as surgical masks or face shields, which nurses discussed was scary for them and concerning as they didn't know if um, they may be at risk for um, actually catching COVID-19. Beyond that, they were especially concerned that they could pass the virus on unknowingly to their family, um, elderly parents or children at home. And this was a major concern for many of the nurses we spoke to. Beyond their family, some of the nurses were also concerned even with passing the virus on to the public. Um, as one example, one of the nurses we spoke to had contractors coming into their home for repairs and wasn't entirely sure about what to say to them about their work environment and their involvement in treating patients with COVID-19. Um, and then finally, nurses were especially concerned with, with actually passing the virus on to their patient, especially those who were working with immunocompromised um, populations, such as the transplant nurses um, and nurses who work with elderly patients. Um, they recognized that they were actually the ones moving in and out of the hospital or the care settings and um, potentially had an opportunity to bring a virus in or actually expose their patients who were in the acute care setting, which was um, concerning for them as well. So moving on, a major theme that we've, sorry, I'm seeing these people come up, um, that we've seen come up is the moral distress that that is related to COVID restrictions and measures. So there's a number of different restrictions and measures that have impacted nurses' experience of distress. Um, and I'll just briefly touch on a few of these examples. So some nurses expressed a lack of confidence in their skills that was a result of changing staffing models. So either being redeployed to areas that they weren't familiar with or um, in a lot of acute care settings, having nurses from uh, wards or units be uh, trained to be able to go work in the ICU. Um, if needed. And one of our participants noted that um, they were not an ICU nurse and they weren't feeling confident in um, kind of managing these patients independently. Um, there was also a lack of resources, which really impacted um, the distress that, that nurses would feel. And this is not only kind of tangible resources in terms of PPE or equipment, but just in terms of staffing and um, nurses as resources themselves. And in this example, um, the nurse who was working with the homeless community and in the shelter system felt that they weren't able to provide the level of care that they were used to providing. Um, just because there was only one of them and the usual services and resources had been completely shut down um, and there were fewer nurses available to do the work that they were doing. 
Another concern that came up related to COVID restrictions and measures was the withdrawal of treatment that may have occurred with a lack of nursing input. As Elizabeth mentioned, um, end of life uh, situations can often be morally distressing for nurses, especially where there's measures of aggressive care. Um, but this nurse, in this example, felt that there may have been a situation where care what, or treatment was withdrawn from a patient um, in order to reallocate beds or make space in the hospital setting for other patients, and um, that they felt generally that nurses are happy to keep chronic patients um, you know, stable and going, but that a different decision might have been made in this situation because of the COVID pandemic, which placed restrictions and um, kind of challenged resource allocations. One of, I think, the most major themes that came up um, that connected for moral distress of nurses was the lack of family support that was a result of limitations on visitor policies. Um, and this, I would say, came up across the board for pretty much all of the nurses that we spoke to in, in all of the different settings. Um, and just as an example, from this nurse who worked in labor and delivery, uh, they had a patient who had five previous losses and had finally carried a baby to term, but during the delivery process had developed a fever, which this nurse explained can be common during the labor and delivery process, but because of the new COVID restrictions, she had to ask the husband to leave before uh, the baby had been born. And she just expressed how awful this experience was and how horrified she was to actually have to ask um, family members to leave their loved ones in some of these extremely challenging situations um, and, and, and have them experience illness and, and um, kind of life events completely alone. There was, Again, moral distress related to reduced or compromised services. Um, this was especially seen in, in the example where we look at the transplant population and um, the nurse that we spoke to really thought about how many of her patients or people may have died waiting for a transplant during the time that all transplant surgeries um, and surgeries in general were put on hold unless they were um, extremely urgently needed. And so they talked a lot about how not only were surgeries unable to go forward, but organs may have been wasted or unused because people were still dying, but um, those organs weren't actually able to, to go to a new patient because of the restriction on, on surgical services. Um, nurses also mentioned frequently that they weren't able to respond to patient concerns as rapidly as they wished to because of the requirement of the isolation rooms and the PPE that was needed. So um, they mentioned things like seeing patients rip out an NG tube or an ET tube or IVs or try to get out of bed unsafely, for example, um, and had to try to verbally um, um, interact with the patient as opposed to their usual response of rushing into the room and being able to respond to that concern. And that was really challenging for them. Um, and then there was the compromised therapeutic relationships. And this was really challenging, I think, in a number of ways. But um, in this first example, we heard from a mental health nurse who heard, who explained that they had to um, lock a patient's door to you know, make sure they wouldn't come outside or use chemical restraints until they could confirm that a patient was not COVID positive um, and that th those types of experiences were really distressing for nurses who wouldn't normally result to those types of measures unless absolutely required, but because of the COVID restrictions were required to implement some of those um, very restrictive kind of interventions um, more often. Also, nurses noted that just generally patients aren't able to see them and engage with them as well. They've got um, a face shield and gown and scrubs, gloves, and are just covered in PPE um, for their entire shift. And so they're really challenged to engage in the therapeutic relationship and connect with patients in the same way. So the final major theme um, that we wanted to discuss was the distress that comes up as associated with inadequate organizational or leadership support. 
So many of the nurses we spoke to felt that they didn't necessarily have much input or choice into things that happened to them in their work environment. Um, this nurse expressed that her and her colleagues felt blindsided by, by the decision to become a COVID unit. She felt that there was no input from frontline staff um, when this decision was made and that basically there, herself and her colleagues were being told that they, they had no choice and they were expected to come in um, and engage in work that looked very different from the work that they normally would have done um, without seeking their, their invite, advice or input. Uh, nurses felt that there was a lack of transparency, which kind of contrib contributed to a sense of distrust that was felt by many frontline nurses. Um, as, this, as this nurse noted, um, that sh they weren't clear on how the decisions around workflows were implemented or how infection prevention and control po protocols were decided upon. Um, and that because of this, uh, there was a sense of distrust that developed between higher leadership, especially in regards to infection and prevention um, due to this lack of transparency in decision-making. There was a sense that perhaps there was a lack of concern for nurses who did contract COVID. And um, there was one nurse we spoke to who did actually contract COVID-19. Um, and expressed that they felt much more disposable after that experience than they had at the beginning of this or prior to the pandemic. And that um, despite the fact that they did uh, catch COVID and recover, they felt that their organization or their leadership didn't care about them as much as they wished they would have, considering that they're on the front lines of, of fighting this virus. Um, there was a lack of in-person contact with leadership. So um, nurses expressed that often leadership that was representing them or their governing body weren't present on the unit or on the ward and didn't have much insight into what nurses were actually experiencing or struggling with. Um, this nurse expressed that, you know, that this representation or the, the director um, was very much absent and disconnected and not on the same page as the frontline staff that they perhaps represented, which was extremely upsetting and a frustrating experience for them. So now I will pass it over to Sean, who's going to discuss some of the strategies to reduce distress and moral distress. Uh, thank you very much, Tegan. Um, so as part of our study, we did ask participants to discuss the ways that their moral distress but also their distress in general might be reduced. And I think one of the central aims of our study is uh, what are we going to do in practice? How can we support nurses to manage uh, what's happening uh, with regards to COVID-19? So one of the major themes that came up in our study was receiving support from other people. So support with nursing colleagues was a major significant finding in the data. Um, people described how um, it was often only nursing colleagues who experienced similar situations could authentically understand their circumstances. For instance, one participant said, you know, the colleagues that have been directly involved in the most distressing situations, I feel like speaking to that person and just kind of validating, yeah, that was terrible. That was an awful situation. The interprofessional team also formed uh, a source of support and nurses described the importance of working collaboratively uh, with other disciplines in very challenging clinical situations. So one really kind of powerful quote is a participant said, I think there's a recognition of the type of specific risk and difficulties for each profession that their interprofessional colleagues are recognizing. Uh, managerial support was often described as a very significant and important form. Um, this participant said, our manager and CCL are lovely, speaking to them, so talking and discussing cases behind closed doors, venting, just sharing raw emotions and validating are, an, are uh, another certainly has helped a lot. So one participant actually described how a manager's support of reflective practice and a space to discuss the complexities of what was happening uh, helped process their own form of distress. Uh, some participants reported seeing a professional therapist, but this form of support drew a mixed reaction. 
Some participants described seeing a therapist as incredibly helpful, whereas other people said that a therapist would only have a limited understanding about the realities of nursing practice during COVID-19. Um, and participants often described the support uh, from their loved ones. So for instance, uh, with regards to this mixed reaction, uh, a participant said, I don't wanna to talk to someone on the phone who can't possibly appreciate what I'm going through and what I'm living through right now. So again, the sense of, of uh, nurses understanding nurses uh, became really central in our data. We also asked participants about how patients, families, but also the bar broader public response to nursing work in the context of COVID-19, how did that impact their sense of distress uh, and moral distress? So participants describe the importance of seeing some of their patients respond well to care uh, and get better under their care. And that was highly meaningful uh, and helped alleviate some of the, the challenges uh, of uh, engaging in practice in COVID-19. Um, nurses and nurse study also described how being thanked by patients and families for their care helped mitigate their own distress. For instance, one participant stated, uh, I might need some happiness for my patients from my work. It's not that I just need happiness for my family and for my personal life. So when I see these patients who are waking up starting to get normal, starting to get normal. I feel very happy. We also asked participants about the, 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 I call it the high profile label of hero that's sometimes described in the mass media uh, and also other public discussions. And uh, once again, there was a mixed response. Some participants described feeling really validated and appreciated by this kind of highly visible public outpouring. Um, other participants described how the late hero label might eventually fade away uh, and that their recognition of nurses uh, might return to normal. So for instance, this participant said, I'm doing the same work. I'm giving the same care that I do every day of the year. And when this is all over, I'm gonna be doing the same kind of work when all the hero stuff goes away. Uh, the corporate response um, was also interesting as well. Um, and the corporate response, meaning from the business sector, we think of um, uh, supports through emails or congratulating nurses or YouTube videos. This also drew Rick's reaction from our participants. Uh, some participants describe the kind of uh, appreciation for the pragmatic supports, like being offered food uh, and sometimes free hotels. But we're really skeptical of the intent of corporations to publicly support nurses. For instance, one participant stated very powerfully, I personally started to feel it became a bit of more of a performative action, uh, like a virtue signaling of companies just kind of jumping in to say that they did something for nurses or frontline heroes to make their company kind of look better. Another major theme in the study was that uh, participants describe a variety of self-care strategies that they employ to reduce their own sense of personal distress. For instance, participants described online shopping, uh, exercise uh, and outdoor activities. Some participants also described uh, meditation and mindfulness as a way to manage uh, stress. For instance, one participant stated, um, I've really never done it before in my life, but certainly um, when I'm having a stressful day at home or something like that, I kind of feel like something that I never thought I would use in the past, but I feel like, like now I have used it. Um, some participants also describe the importance of prayer, spirituality, and reflection. So to conclude this section of our talk where we present our findings, I'd like to briefly summarize uh, the kind of main themes in our study. So one of the major themes is that we looked at the origins or the sources of moral distress and distress in general. Uh, and some of our kind of broader themes include the fear of affecting others and self, COVID restrictions and measures, and also the lack of organizational leadership and support. We also examined the multiple ways that participants might reduce moral distress and distress in general. And some of the major themes that we uncovered in our analysis are receiving support from others, 
receiving the public's response and also personal distress reducing actions. So I can return it back to Dr. Elizabeth Peter who will be discussing uh, recommendations. Thank you, Sean. Um, yes, I'll be talking about recommendations and some of these are at the individual level, some are at the organizational level and some are at the level of policy. So depending on how you're situated, you'll have a different role potentially in these recommendations. And these recommendations we've taken out of our findings and also from some of the things that we're finding in our scoping review, again, to strengthen the recommendations. And we're, we're attempting to be um, as specific and helpful as possible. So some fundamentals. And, and generally speaking, these would happen um, at the level of an organization. And no doubt throughout, there need to be consistent and robust infection prevention and control policies. These need to be in place. Um, I mean, obviously at the beginning of the pandemic, there were, there were more shortages of PPE. There was less known about COVID-19. And so as far as we can tell, these things are getting better, but these need to be consistent and having that adequate access to PPE. Because from an ethics point of view, certainly nurses are ethically important in and of themselves and their self-care is important. And without that, they really, can't adequately turn their attention to other people. So all of those things need to be in place for both the safety of nurses and their patients and their family members and so on. Some of these things are sort of self-evident. There needs to be appropriate staffing so that workload doesn't become another issue um, with respect to stress and also with respect to con infection control. Our participants so frequently talked about visitor policies and those really need to be clear, publicly available and written whenever possible so that there is consistency. So when nurses are having to reinforce those policies, those visitors know that it isn't just um, a decision that you know is made, you might say on a whim, that this is about something uh, about entire organizations and the rationale behind those visitor policies. Again, some of these, uh, some of these things are, are, are fairly obvious. Continuing with any of those self-care activities that people are doing on an individual level. Uh, we found lots of support in the literature as well, um, speaking to the importance of things like exercise, family, hobbies, meditation and prayer and so on. So those things and having the opportunity to engage in those things are very important. I think though one of our biggest takeaways was the importance of moral community. Um, and this is something that's created both at, by individuals and organizations. There's an entire literature on moral community. I've given you here one definition by Woschel, and it speaks to clinical environments um, or organizations, in fact, being large moral communities where people come together with common ethical commitments. And, and Woschel here also talks about the importance of self-care. And so leaders of moral communities need to make sure that we're all taking care of our, ourselves because without that, um, we can't build the kind of support and so on that people need. Again, throughout the studies that we looked at, we found the importance of collective moral support. Um, we saw that in our own data, how important it was for nurses to be supported uh, among each other with both the nursing team, the interprofessional team, having that um, potential for moral dialogue. Some people talk about having a moral space to be able to talk about hard, hard um, experiences, about challenging cases um, and having that mutual respect and opportunity for reflection. One of the other things too that we found that was a little bit surprising um, or maybe I never thought about it uh, to the extent I needed to is that how important that in-person support was. 
Um, our participants talked about, you know, the support at the uh, at a distance being okay, but they really, really appreciate it when um, anyone in a leadership or support position came and worked with them at the bedside so that that person would have a deep understanding of what those uh, nurses were experiencing. So that in-person support, again, when possible, um, was very valued. This is an, another one that, again, we found this in the literature and within our own participants, is a need to celebrate patient improvements and to receive gratitude. Um, some, some nurses are working in areas where their patients are transferred out before they can ever have the opportunity to see them get better, um, for them to be well enough to say thank you and so on. So when privacy allows, um, it's important to share positive stories of patient improvement after they get discharged, perhaps from ICU, from the ER, and also to share the gratitude that many of these patients and their families provide. I mean, granted, some of our patients don't have the capacity to express gratitude um, and they don't improve, if you will, and they deserve, of course, the same level of excellent care. But when we can have the opportunity to celebrate these things, uh, those are important to people's well being. Another thing um, is with respect to leadership. And when I say this, I always have a little bit of um, ambivalence because I realize that particularly leaders that are in a sort of a middle position in organization, they also are being constrained and are probably being quite distressed themselves. So when I, when I say this, um, I, I realize that those, their actions are often constrained themselves but whenever possible to foster that kind of transparency and that collective kind of decision-making where nurses have a voice um, was deeply appreciated in those instances where our participants experienced it. Um, excellent communication is needed, educational opportunities. Um, interestingly, in the literature, there were, there were some nurses really appreciated food um, some, some of those tangible things to keep going. The professional mental health supports, some of our participants found them helpful, some of them didn't, but for those who do, um, and I realized that many um, hospitals and other care facilities and in, you know, community organizations are providing these and they're helpful for some people. Um, obviously the need to recognize the time for time off and limit and limit overtime um, because there really are limits to how much someone can experience and take in. Now the public recognition, again, um, we call this cautious reception of it. People have mixed feelings about some of the public recognition. Um, and so what we suggest is accepting it with a critical mindset, realizing that we need to um, advocate for improved patient care and, and for working conditions for nurses. So that this isn't just a one time only, aren't you great, but it's, it's a need to have this ongoing recognition of the importance of nursing work and a, a recognition of what those working conditions are and how they can be improved. In, in one study uh, by Kim, um, and in her study, she was looking at MERS in South Korea. She talked about there as well, a whole nurses feeling like they were forgotten warriors. They were celebrated at the time and then forgotten. And this is something we really truly want to avoid happening. And at a policy and social level, uh, for those of us who have a, you know, a bit of power in that regard, again, this need for recognition of nursing work, uh, improved working conditions and salaries for nurses. And I would extend that to include um, personal support workers, and all those um, of us who are providing care. Um, Equity-oriented health and social policies are also needed as we become more and more aware of how inequities are shaping who is becoming ill and what their illness experience is and their long-term outcomes and so on. 
And so for the well-being of all of society, we really need a, a focus on those things that are equity oriented. So those are our, um, our work in a nutshell. Again, it's preliminary, but we really wanted to get out our findings now that we're in a second wave. And so that some of these recommendations and things that we've come to understand uh, can be brought to bear in practice. Great, I'll take over. Um, my name is Jan McIver. Uh, we're going to do the questions through the chat box. So type away. And while you're getting started, I do have a couple of questions for our research team. Um, Tegan, you talked about uh, the visitor policy. Um, was there any strategies that uh, participants mentioned that um, helped improve the communication between patients and families who were separated because of COVID-19? Yes, hi, okay. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, there was definitely some um, talk of kind of patients who had their own cell phones with, especially in the labor delivery world, um, there was discussion of FaceTiming partners in for deliveries and having uh, nurses engage in, in that kind of support to be sure that, that partners could be involved. Um, there were also initiatives in, in certain settings where um, iPads or various types of technology were available for patients to be able to communicate um, with their family members if they were isolated for an extended period of time and unable to speak with their visitors. Um, however, there were some areas where that wasn't necessarily a possibility. I One person comes to mind who worked in the emergency department and said, you know, they have no TVs and no phones and no real ability to facilitate that or they didn't at the moment just because of the kind of transitory nature of emergency department where people are moving in and out quite rapidly and and didn't have the infrastructure to support that unless the patient had their own device so I think it's definitely something to uh, continue to, to think about going forward especially with a second wave and if the limitations on visitors are, are going to come back. Perfect. Can you um, just pop up the next slide? I think we have our diagram on that one. Um, Dr. Acorn has made a good comment about, oh, sorry, it's Sarah, Dr. Flogan, my apologies, um, about the example from labor and delivery uh, in terms of uh, Benner's um, expert knowledge and knowing when a fever is not uncommon in labor in that situation, did the uh, policies actually restrict their abilities to engage in critical thinking? It's a very valid point. Um, there wasn't really any discussion about, uh, well, there was some discussion about modification of unit policies, but not necessarily at the hospital level because these were uh, frontline nurses with um, some advanced practice nurses. That's a very good point, Sarah. We'll uh, make sure we add that into our future discussions. There um, was one example though, Jane, that came, um, I'm sorry, uh, from public health. Is that the one you were gonna talk about, Sean? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, you can finish. Yeah, there was an example of a participant from public health who kind of judged whether this, whether they should do a home visit or not. And they were working with very vulnerable people who could absolutely benefit, who would be harmed if there wasn't a, a nurse uh, present uh, or in the home. Um, so the, the nurse described really appreciating the manager's uh, kind of respect for their nursing judgment and their critical thinking to, to kind of, uh, when there was absolute need for a visit to kind of um, be flexible around the, the policies around uh, no visitation. But I think the nurse really appreciated a kind of a dialogue as opposed to kind of um, a rigid enforcement of the policy uh, related to COVID. Great. Um, uh, and sorry, I'm trying to catch up on my very tiny uh, box. 
um, the overwhelming burden that is placed on uh, bedside nurses having to be the enforcer. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to talk a little bit about that in terms of moral distress and the nurses having to enforce some of these restrictions? Yeah, I mean, what makes this so distressing for nurses is obviously they're the ones that are in close proximity to these family members and to the patients and so on, which is going to put them in an acutely distressing situation. And so obviously wherever there is input uh, from nurses, this is a, a very good idea because, you know, we visiting policies are there for a reason. But, and I know I put this in, uh, you know, we put this into one of the recommendations. There also needs to be ways of using those policies in an intelligent and clinically informed way. So when there are exceptions made to them, it would be very good that nurses could use their clinical judgment. So perhaps they're more of a, a, a good guideline. Um, the way they're typically used in hospitals, that's what's happening. As long as those are informed by, you know, great evidence coming from uh, about COVID-19, but there are situations where I think that we're asking nurses to do the impossible and the things that are not in their own best judgment. So uh, this again came up in our in our data so frequently were those visitor policies and the confusion around them too. Their inconsistencies around them um, was something that came out a lot. So well, being at the table to set those is absolutely essential. And the absence of any type of written uh, dispute resolution um, during the days when the manager was there or when the team leader was there, uh, you know, things seemed to go okay. But on nights, um, sometimes nurses had difficulty when family uh, didn't agree with the policies. Or sometimes when some, you know, a patient would really be declining mm -hmm. uh, rapidly. And uh, I think the visitor policy, it, it was about ethics, but it's also about standard of care, which of course is also about ethics. Uh, I recall interviewing someone who uh, was an emergency room nurse and was caring for someone that had very advanced dementia and their family member wasn't allowed to, to be present with them. So they were doing an assessment um, uh, and not having that much information about the kind of medical and life history of a person. So I think uh, we're starting to see the, or our, our study looked at the reverberating effects of visitor policies as well. Yes. Uh, Michelle Acorn has asked about any difference between categories of nurses, uh, RPN, RN, and MP. Who would like to take that one? I can start. Um, I know Jane, you spoke to a lot of the APN, so maybe you can speak to that um, mm -hmm. secondly, but I think it's a great question and it was something we've talked about kind of actively and throughout the um, recruitment and study process. Um, we initially wrote the study up for RNs um, and had a lot of interest from APNs as well. And so um, did include a number of APNs in, in different environments. Um, and just because of the, the scope of RPNs and the focus on long-term care, et cetera, um, we decided that that might be an entirely different project on its own that deserves its own um, focus because there were uh, some nurses who worked in con closely in conjunction with RPNs and PSWs and, and spoke about the effects on them and just how uh, they deserve better education and better pay and better recognition for the roles that they do play, especially um, at the front lines of, of COVID. Um, but in order to kind of keep the sample in a way that, that we could make sense of the data, we did just choose to focus on the RNs and the APNs for, for this portion of the study. And maybe Jane can speak a little bit about the differences with what the APNs experience versus the, the RNs. So the, the APNs, uh, CNSs and NPs that we interviewed were all at the front lines and working with patients. Uh, so they had a lot of the similar concerns related to um, the uh, managing the moral distress. 
Um, one of the things that they did mention was their role as leaders and how staff nurses look to them for um, to demonstrate their comfort level uh, in using the PPE, especially early on when uh, staff were assigned one surgical mask and how they felt even though they had concerns uh, themselves about one surgical mask that they needed to demonstrate trust in the organization and the decision makers by actually donning that mask and, and the PPE and going in and providing care for patients. So that was one area where they felt different. Um, and also how uh, taking the time to talk to staff nurses about what they were seeing in the media and what they were hearing um, through the uh, organizational um, town halls and how to interpret the science that was behind some of that um, and some of the misleading facts. So they had a really strong role on the units that uh, they were practicing on in terms of leadership in, in providing um, support to, to the nurses and, and to housekeepers and nutrition and social workers. Uh, Michelle's asking another question. Michelle, I don't know what APM means. Oh, APN. <laughs> yes, advanced practice nursing um, to support and build capacity. Yes, and and how some of them actually uh, were participating on uh, organizational committees um, and felt that that helped um, their interactions with uh, staff at the unit level. Elizabeth, I have a question for you. Um, how can we promote moral community uh, within organizations and on units? Are there some kind of practical strategies that we might be able to use? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is first recognizing that we all play a part in that. And so it's, it's not necessarily something that we need to wait for in terms of somebody in a formal leadership position to do. Um, start. It's something we can all start in the sense of opening up those kinds of conversations with other people. Um, pandemics um, tend to draw people together. Um, at least what we've seen from this study, generally speaking, and in some of the literature, and hopefully they, that lasts. Um, that being said, formal leadership also has a, an opportunity to be involved in this in, in getting nurses together, um, talking about ethical issues, um, naming them as ethical issues, and, and also the way we value the care of each other is, is incredibly um, central to this. So anything, you know, in patient care, we're always very focused on not turning patients into objects and changing our mindset about that. And that that kind of thinking also needs to be done with respect to how nurses are treated. Um, they're not just names on a timesheet. They're not just there to, to fill a particular role. Um, you know, they're living and breathing humans as, as everyone and also need support and care and all of those things. So those things um, are, are, in general, there has been in recent years more emphasis on that. Um, but it's central to ethics. And again, having those ethical conversations, they can come from an ethicist, they could come from a chaplain, but they can very much come from anyone working um, in any capacity. Um, and I like the way, Jane, you talked about other, other people working in a setting. You know, we typically refer to the interprofessional team, but we also have people who are cleaning, people who are providing admin support, and they're all part of that culture as well. Mm -hmm. uh, of being able to mutually rely on one another. I mean, no doubt that all sounds Pollyanna. I always wonder about the one or two uh, toxic people who seem to, there seem to be one and two or, or two in any kind of workplace um, that may um, need some formal leadership intervention with them. So um, those, you know, again, I. It's usually only a small minority 
um, but finding ways to work around that person and, and to call them out, I think is important as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Julie McShane has a question, and this one uh, will be for you too, Elizabeth. Um, many aspects of COVID planning uh, were generated at the tasks and tables. And uh, do we have strategies, KT strategies focused to TASN or uh, Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care? Yeah, I hope to. I know um, I have direct links to, at least to the bioethics table. Um, and I'm hoping that through that table, we can push things further into some of the other ones. Um, I think, and at least I hope, that with the disaster of long-term care, there is a little bit more openness to the breadth of things that we need to consider during a pandemic. And it's not just about allocating uh, ventilators, but it's very much about the workforce and the well-being of the workforce. So we, we will find our ways, um, whether they're direct or indirect, because I think they do need to hear from us because they need to hear from nurses. Uh, and I don't, I mean, there's some nursing representation on those tables, but there's not enough. Uh, and particularly given our numbers uh, and our central role through all of this, um, those are great suggestions to bring it to, to those tables. And we, there is some interest from the chief nursing officers at some of the downtown hospitals who have offered to help us uh, disseminate some of that. And uh, we're going to close now. Over to you, Shauna. I'm actually going to take over. Thank you so much to all of you for, for this really informative presentation. We really appreciate you uh, presenting this research to our alumni today. Um, thank everyone on the line for attending. We really appreciate uh, you being here today. Please stay tuned for the invitation to our next Lunch and Learn, which will be on November 17th. And finally, just some thank yous to, again, to Lairdall Medical Canada, to Shauna Spicer, and to the Bloomberg Nursing IT team for helping us to organize today's event. And we look forward to sending you an email with the recording of this session, as well as with a survey for some feedback. So again, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much.